Welcome, my name is Deborah Walker, and I'm speaking to you from Revival from Down Under, which is a Christian church located in the eastern suburbs of Melbourne in Australia. I'd like to welcome you all here today. And those watching online, delighted to have you with us. And today I'd like to speak on a topic that I've called, Is it possible for Christians to go to hell? Is it possible for Christians to go to hell? And this question can only be answered by scripture and should only be answered by what scripture says. So I just pray that um, we'll all have ears to hear and a heart to receive the answer as shown in scripture. And I'm just going to open my King James Bible to Matthew chapter 4 and read what Jesus said. Matthew 4 verse 4, But he, Jesus answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Hallelujah. Every word is all scripture, which Paul says, I'll just turn to it, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. Just turn there quickly. It says here, 16 and 17, it says, All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God, and that includes ladies, it's the, it's the uh, species of man, the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Hallelujah. And also we read in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15, just turn back, it says here, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needs not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. So this studying of God's word from all scripture, which is of the Old and the New Testament, that is all scripture, is to be done by all Christians, not just those in ministry or in leadership. It's for all Christians because if you're reading it, well, it's God speaking to you just as much. And we need all scripture so we do not get deceived by false brethren, false prophets, false apostles, false teachers, and false Christs, all of which we are told will be active in the days just prior to Jesus' return. And even Jesus, he makes mention of false Christs and false prophets. Matthew, let's turn back there, Matthew 24. Matthew 24 and verse 5. And Jesus said here, for many shall come in my name, saying that I am Christ and shall deceive many. And verse 11, and it says, And many false prophets shall rise and shall deceive many. And verse 24, For there shall arise false Christs and false prophets and shall show great signs and wonders insomuch that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. And if we turn over to 2 Corinthians chapter 11, 2 Corinthians chapter 11, we read here what about false apostles. 2 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 13. And it says here, For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. All right, they're not the true. And that's the thing. It's, if it's a deception, it almost looks right, but there's just something not quite right. All right, if it was really blatantly obvious, you'd say, well, that's false. And so a deception is always something that's just, just, just off of center, if I can say it that way. And in verse 26, we read of um, false brethren. Verse 26. In this is Paul speaking, in journeyings often, in perils of waters, in perils of robbers, in perils of my own countrymen, in perils by the heathen, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren. And he went really went through it, didn't he? But we're just leading, learning here there can be false apostles, false teachers, false prophets. And in Second Peter... Chapter 2, we're going to read of false prophets and false teachers. 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 1. 
And this is what Peter says, but there were false prophets among also the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you who privily shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them and bring upon themselves swift destruction. Hmm. So we must not give ourselves to anything false as everything declared needs to line up with scripture. Amen. Hallelujah. And meanwhile, the purpose of scripture is to sanctify us to produce fruit. And that word sanctify means to cleanse and purify. And this sanctifying is a process of washing to cleanse our flesh. Our spirit is saved by the blood of Jesus, but it's the word of God that cleanses our flesh. Even Jesus said, I'll read it in John 17, 17. Jesus said, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. So how are we going to be sanctified, cleansed and, and purified? By the word of God. And if we turn back to John chapter 13 and verses 6 to 8. Jeez, we read what Jesus said to Peter. Verses 6 to 8. And then cometh he to Simon Peter, and Peter says unto him, Lord, dost thou wash my feet? And Jesus answered and said unto him, What I do thou knowest not now, but thou shalt know hereafter. Peter says unto him, Thou shalt never wash my feet. And Jesus answered him, If I wash thee not, thou hast no part with me. All Christians are part of his body and require washing so as to be joined to the head, Jesus. And when are we going to be joined to the head? In the marriage. And if we turn over to Ephesians chapter 5, Ephesians chapter 5, and we read here in verses 26 and 27, that he might sanctify and cleanse it, the church, with the washing of water by the word. That he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. Hallelujah. So as the word is being declared, the scriptures are washing our hearts. Amen. And the cleansing of the flesh is shown in John 15. Let's turn back there. John 15. As a purging of the branch to produce fruit. John 15 verse 2. Jesus said, Every branch in me that bears not fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he purges it, that it may bring forth more fruit fruit. That word purges comes from the same Greek word used for cleanse when we just read it in Ephesians 5, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might sanctify and purge it with the washing of the water by the word. You know, I have fruit trees in my backyard and in Australia we have these cutting instruments in the garden, they're called secateurs and fruit trees. In order to produce fruit, you have to cut off the dead wood right? Cut off the dead wood and then in their season they produce fruit. Well, it's the same in God with us. His word is a sharp two-edged sword and he wants to cut out of our hearts anything that's not of him, that's dead, that's not, that is, dis that whatever is displeasing to him, that whatever doesn't measure up to the word, he wants to remove it and he's doing it by his word. And aren't we grateful for that? And you know, we have a part to play in all of this, in making good choices and by hearing a word that washes our heart. All right. We, you know, if I was going to have a, um, I'll say a shower, um, a couple of drops of water aren't going to make me totally clean. I need a deluge of water. Well, <clears throat> as believers, we need a deluge of the word of God to cleanse what's in our heart. And we don't even know what's in our heart fully. We think we do, but, you know, God looks on the heart. So we have our part to do. So turning over to 2 Corinthians chapter 7. And it says here in verse 1. It 
says here in Second Corinthians, chapter seven, verse one. And it says here, having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. So that's what I'm saying. Let us cleanse ourselves. We can make good choices and not give place to things. All right, come on. We're growing in God. We don't have to say yes to everything that presents itself to us. Christians need to say no, no. Because why? Because I love God. And I want to live a life that's going to glorify God. Amen. And also the cleansing of the flesh is partly our responsibility. And what's the flesh? Let's turn over to Galatians chapter 5. Let's start in verse 16. And we read here through to verse 21. This I say, walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusts against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary, the one to the other, so that you cannot do the things that you would. But if you be led of the spirit, you are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these. Adultery, that's having sexual intimacy with someone other than your spouse. Fornication is the same thing, having sexual int intimacy with someone you're not married to. Uncleanness, that's stirring up and lasciviousness, stirring up passions in others that really should only be fulfilled within marriage. Uh, idolatry, things coming before God. Witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife. God hates strife. Seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like of which I tell you before, as I've also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. You know, God is holy and righteous. And if we are participating in any of these activities and we took our last breath, then those activities will take us to hell. You'll not inherit the kingdom of God. So if those activities are currently in our world, you know, we need to repent. Make sure we're up to date with God and ask the Lord to take these activities out of our heart. Right. But it's not just the sexual things. It's our attitudes. It's hatred. It's envying. It's strife. It's all those things that can come out of the heart of man. And if we turn over to back to first Corinthians chapter six. First Corinthians chapter six, we read what the Bible says in verse chapter six, verses nine to ten. Know you not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. And I'm going to read it through the Amplified Bible, verse 9 to 10. Do you not know that the unrighteous and the wrongdoers will not inherit or have any share in the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, misled, neither the impure and immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor those who participate in homosexuality, nor cheats, swindlers and thieves nor greedy graspers, nor drunkards, nor foul-mouthed revilers and slanderers, nor extortioners and robbers will inherit or have any share in the kingdom of God. That's really clear, isn't it? And also in 1 John 1 verse 17, chapter 1, chapter, 1 John chapter 5 verse 17, 1 John chapter 5, verse 17, it says here, the first part, it says, all unrighteousness is sin. That means all wrongdoing is sin in God's eyes. You may be around people who do this or they do that and they do this and they do that. It's not about what others do. It's about God's standards and God's ways. And God's way is perfect and he has high standards. And he expects us as believers to conform, to yield our lives to him and his word. 
And why do we, we just said all unrighteousness is sin. And what happens with sin? Romans chapter 6, verse 23, it says, for the wages of sin is death. Doesn't get any clearer that than that, does it? But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. All right, but the wages of sin is death. That's, a, that's not just only a natural death, it's a spiritual death, an absolute separation for God, from God for all eternity. And, and even Jude, this is the book just before Revelation, Jude, only one chapter, and verse 23 says, And others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment spotted by the flesh. If our garment is spotted, that's the garment of salvation, we will not be part of Christ's bride because she is, we've just read it before, she's without spot, blemish and wrinkle. I'll just read it, it says Ephesians 5, 27, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but it should be holy and without blemish. All right. And we read earlier in Galatians 5, 21 about the envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings and such like of the which I tell you before, as I've told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. God's talking to his church here. Church at Rome, the church at Galatia. He's talking to believers. And Jesus also spoke about our flesh. Let's turn to Matthew chapter 15. Matthew 15. And verses 18 to 20, and Jesus said, But those things which proceed out of the mouth come from the heart, and they defile the man. For out of the heart proceeds evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, blasphemies. These are things which defile a man, but to eat with unwashed hands defiles not a man. So it's the works of the flesh that defile us. And I'm just going to turn over to Hebrews chapter 12 and see what Paul says. Hebrews 12 and verses 14 to 15. And he says here, Follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. Looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you and thereby many be defiled. That word where it says fail of the grace of God, that means to fall from the grace of God. I'll read it from the Amplified Bible, verse 14 and 15. Strive to live in peace with everybody and pursue that consecration and holiness without which no one will ever see the Lord. Exercise foresight and be on the watch to look after one another, to see that no one falls back from or fails to secure God's grace, his unmerited favour and spiritual blessing in order that no root of bitterness or no root of resentment, rancour, bitterness or hatred shoots forth and causes trouble and bitter torment and many become contaminated and defiled by it. That's pretty strong, isn't it? Our words, how we treat others can defile them. So it's not just always activities. That just said our words can defile others. And we read of the city of God. Let's turn to Revelation 21. Revelation chapter 21 and verse 27. Regarding the city of God. And it says, and there shall no wise enter into it, the city of God, anything that defileth, neither whatsoever works abomination or makes a lie, but they which are written in the Lamb's book of life. The city is the bride of Jesus. Hallelujah. And verse in the Amplified, it says, but nothing that defiles or profanes or is unwashed shall ever enter into it nor anyone who commits abominations, unclean, detestable, 
morally repugnant things or practices falsehood, but only those whose names are recorded in the Lamb's book of life. You know, how many people do you hear? They just lie. They just lie. They just, or they twist the, they twist the story and it's just people get the wrong idea and people think nothing of it. Well, this says all liars not going to heaven and that they put that alongside abominations. So, you know, we just need to look at ourselves first. I'm looking, pointing at me, look at ourselves first, make sure we're walking the walk. And Revelation 21 verse, go back to 9 to 11, it says here, just earlier in the chapter. And there came unto me one of the seven angels, which have the seven vials full of the seven last plagues, and talked with me saying, come hither, I will show thee the bride, the lamb's wife. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me that great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God, having the glory of God. And her light was like unto a stone most precious, even like a jasper stone, clear as crystal. Praise God, clear as crystal. No flaws in her. She's beautiful. She will have been fully prepared. And when I say she, the bride of Christ is made up of males and females. Hallelujah. And you know, where was she? Coming out of heaven. And where are we meant to be as believers? Seated in heavenly places. Hallelujah. And we go back to Galatians chapter 5. I mean, God wants us all to make it. He really does. That's why he's given us his word. Galatians 5, verse 1, it says, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty where the Christ has made us free, and be not entangled again, with the yoke of bondage. I'll read it from the Amplified. In this freedom, Christ has made us free and completely liberated us. Stand fast then and do not be hampered and held ensnared and submit again to a yoke of slavery which you have once put off. And verse 13, it says, For brethren, you've been called unto liberty, only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another and i'll read that the amplified for you brethren were indeed called to freedom only do not let your freedom be an incentive to your flesh and an opportunity an opportunity or excuse for selfishness but through love you should serve one another all right and then we read what uh, apostle paul says in hebrews chapter 10 verse 22 Starting there to 29. Let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he's faithful that promised. Let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works, and not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching. The day approaching is the Lord's return and we need to be gathering to church more and more, certainly not less. Verse 26, For if we sin willfully after we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remains no more sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful looking up for a, of judgment and fiery indignation which shall devour the adversaries. Verse 28, and he that despised Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses. Of how much sore a punishment suppose you shall be he that thought worthy, who has trodden underfoot the Son of God and has counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing and has done despite unto the Spirit of grace. That last verse 29 in the Amplified. How much worse, sterner and heavier punishment do you suppose he will be judged to deserve who has spurned and thus trampled underfoot the Son of God and who has considered the covenant blood by which he was consecrated common and unhallowed, thus profaning it and insulting and outraging the Holy Spirit who imparts grace and unmerited favour and blessing of God. You know, we cannot just take salvation for granted and just think, oh, you know, just treat it lightly. Remember Esau, he treated his, um, the blessing he had of the firstborn as insignificant. It didn't matter. 
Well, I tell you, it does matter. It does matter. And our walk in God really does matter. And that word, despite, that in that verse 29 said, um, despite, where was it? Despite, has despite unto the spirit of God. That word despite here, it just means insult. It's just insult. Did I read that um, verse 29? Yes, he gave unmerited favor just before that thus profaning it and insulting and outraging the Holy Spirit. Like just, just as nothing, flippantly, just, insig just look at the attitude, all right? And then in verse 38 to 39, it says, Now the just shall live by faith, but if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. But we are not of them who draw back unto perdition, but of them who that believe to the saving of the soul praise god the amplified says 38 39 but the just shall live by faith my righteous servant shall live by his conviction respecting man's relationship to god and divine things and holy fervor born of faith and conjoined with it and if he draws back and shrinks in fear my soul has no delight or pleasure in him but our way is not of that who draw back to eternal miseries perdition and are utterly destroyed. But we are of those who believe, who cleave to and trust in and rely on God through Jesus Christ, the Messiah, and by faith preserve the soul. Hallelujah. We're not going to, with God's help, we're not drawing back. We're not pulling back. We want to keep pressing in. And if we just go back to John 15. Hallelujah. Doesn't give God any pleasure if we draw back at all. And it won't do us any good either. Uh, John 15, you know, we read that Jesus, well, we can read verse 1. He said, I am the true vine and my father is the husbandman. But it says, he's the vine, we're the branches. And any branch that does not produce fruit is cut off. Verse 6, if a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch and is withered. And men gather them and cast them into the fire and they are burned how serious is this and let's turn back to over to romans chapter 11 and verse 21 to 22 it says here for if god spared not the natural branches speaking of natural israel take heed lest he also spare not thee for Behold, therefore, the goodness and severity of God of them which fell. Severity, but towards thee goodness, if thou continue in his goodness, otherwise thou also shall be cut off. That's twice. And 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 to 2, it says here, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also you have received and wherein you stand, by which also you are saved, if you keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless you have believed in vain. I'll read it from the Amplified. And now let me remind you, since it seems to have escaped you, brethren, of the gospel, the glad tidings of salvation, which I proclaim to you, which, were, which you welcomed and accepted and upon which your faith rests and by which you are saved if you hold fast and keep firmly what I preach to you unless you believed at first without effect and all for nothing. All right, we've got it. We, don't, we, we get hold of salvation and we stay with it. We don't just cast it off and let it go. And in Hebrews chapter 3, Hebrews 3, verses 6 to 12, it says here, For of this, sorry, Hebrews, Hebrews 3, 6 to 12, it says here, But Christ is a son over his house, whose house are we, if we hold fast the confidence and rejoicing of the hope, firm until the end. You know, you don't reach the finish line until you get to the finish line. All right. Verse seven. Wherefore, as the Holy Ghost says today, if you will hear his voice, his voice is his word. Harden not your hearts 
as in the provocation, the day of temptation in the wilderness, when your fathers tempted me, proved me and saw my works 40 years. Wherefore, I was grieved with that generation and said, they do always err in their heart and they have not known my ways. So I swear in my wrath, they shall not enter into my rest. Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. So this is a warning to the church. And, you know, I'm just going to turn back to Matthew chapter 24 again. Matthew 24. You know, we're warned many times throughout scripture about deception. And even Jesus said in Matthew chapter 24 and verse 4, And Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you. That, that's no one, right? Take heed. And, and the Amplified says, Be careful that no one misleads you, deceiving you and leading you into error. And I'm going to turn over to 2 Thessalonians. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Second Thessalonians chapter 2. Even the Apostle Paul says concerning Christ's return. Second Thessalonians chapter 2 verse 3. Let no man deceive you by any means. For that day, that's the second coming of the Lord, shall not come except there come a falling away first and the man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. A falling away first. Well, the unsaved are already fallen. They're already in sin. So the falling away is talking about Christians are falling away and the man of sin be revealed. The man, the son of perdition. And the Amplified verse 3 says, Let no one deceive you or beguile you in any way. For that day will not come except the apostasy, that's a falling away, comes first unless the predicted great falling away of those who have professed to be Christians has come. And the man of lawlessness, sin, is revealed, who is the son of doom, of perdition. All right, it absolutely says it in the Amplified. Christians falling away, really clear. And so here we're told clearly by Paul, there will be a falling away of Christians. And why is that going to occur? Well, we can read the answer in verses 10 to 12. It says here, because this son of perdition, what's going to happen? He's going to do, well, I'll go from verse 9. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this cause, God shall send them a strong delusion that they should believe a lie, that they might all be damned who believe not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Read it from the Amplified. It opens it up. Verse 10. And by unlimited seduction to evil and with all wicked deception for those who are perishing, going to perdition because they did not welcome the truth, but refused to love it, that they might be saved. Therefore, God sends upon them a misleading influence, a working of error and a strong delusion to make them believe what is false. In order that all may be judged and condemned who did not believe in, who refused to adhere to, trust in and rely on the truth, but instead took pleasure in unrighteousness. So Christians who have no love for the truth, the word of God, they're going to fall and perish in the days ahead. Why? Because they will not love and believe the truth. The word of God. Therefore, God is going to send a strong delusion and they will believe the lie. And so, unfortunately and sadly, they will perish. But, you know, God gives us a free choice all the way and it's not God's will for any to perish. So if it's not God's will to perish, then whose will is it? We have to look at ourselves because it's not God's will that any perish. 
And so this falling away, let's turn over to Revelation 12. It's shown in the book of Revelation, chapter 12. And verse 4. And it says here, I'll go verse 3. And there appeared another wonder in heaven. Behold, a great red dragon having seven heads and ten hordes and seven crowns upon his heads. And his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven and did cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman which was ready to be, be delivered for devour her child as soon as it was born. All right. His tail is going to pull away a third of the stars. Stars symbolize the spiritual seed of Abraham through Jesus Christ. I'll read it. Genesis 15 verse 5. And the Lord said, And he brought him forth abroad, this is to Abraham, and said, Look towards heaven and tell the stars if thou be able to number them. And he said, So shall thy seed be. That's Abraham. And it's confirmed in Galatians 3 verse 16. Now unto Abraham and his seed where the promise is made, and he saith not unto seeds, as of many, but of one of thy seed is Christ. If we are Christians, we are of the seed, through Christ, of the seed of Abraham. And we are, because we're heavenly, whatever is heavenly is spiritual. We are Christians, we are spiritual, we're born again. So, and we're to be seated in heavenly places. And this tail of the dragon is going to deceive them. And this tail of the dragon, spoken of in, Revelation 12 verse 4 is the false prophet of, let's turn over to Revelation 19 verse 20. Revelation 19 verse 20. And the beast that was taken and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him which, with which he deceived them that received the mark of the beast and them that worshipped his image. These both were cast alive into the lake of fire burning with brimstone. All right. Hmm. He's got a tail. It's the tail of the dragon. And if we turn over to Isaiah chapter 9, because scripture interprets itself, Isaiah 9. Isaiah 9 and verse 15. It's a really important scripture, this. It says here, verse 15. The ancient and honourable, he is the head. And the prophet that teaches lies, he is the tail. All right? The false prophet of Revelation 19.20. The false prophet is also the son of perdition. And it's the son of perdition who causes the falling away of Christians. I mean, those that don't have a heart for the truth, God's going to let them hear the lies from this false prophet and so many are going to get caught. It says a third of the stars are going to fall. A third of the Christians are going to believe this lie. How serious is this? Very. And we just go back to 2 Thessalonians. Chapter 2, Second Thessalonians, chapter 2 and verse 3. Let's read it again. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come except there come a falling away first, and that the man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. All right. Jesus is the only one who can prevent us from falling if we remain in him. Hallelujah. And let's turn over to Revelation chapter 1. And in Revelation uh, chapter 2 and 3, we see or we read about the seven churches. And these seven churches, seven is, means for fullness. They're the fullness of the end time church. And we are right down there now. And we're going to read about it. But Revelation chapter 1. Verses 11 to 12, it says here, saying, I am Alpha and Omega. This is Jesus speaking, the first and the last. And what thou seest, write in a book and send it to the seven churches, which are in Asia, 
in Ephesus, under Ephesus, Smyrna, under Pergamos, under Thyatira, under Sardis, and under Philadelphia, and under Laodicea. And I turned to see the voice that spake with me. As I turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks. And we know when we read those chapters 2 and 3, Jesus tells five of the seven churches to repent because their works are not right. And Revelation chapter 2, verse 1 to 7. Let's read it. Unto the angel of the church of Ephesus write, These things says he that holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. I know thy works and thy labor and thy patience and how thou canst not bear them which are evil. And thou hast tried them which say they are apostles and are not and have found them liars and has borne and has patience and for my name's sake has labored and has not fainted. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee because thou hast left thy first love. Remember therefore from whence thou art fallen and repent and do the first works or else I will come unto thee quickly and I will remove thy candlestick out of its place except thou repent because this thou hast that thou hatest the deeds of the Nicolaitans which I also hate. He that has an ear let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches, to him that overcomes will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Jesus, we warns them to return to their first love or their candlestick will be removed. Their branch will be removed. So their candlestick is one branch of seven. And if the branch is removed, then no fruit can be produced. And in verse four, that first love, um, what's it say? You've left your first love in verse four. That first love in the Greek, it means protos is first and protos agape, your first love, protos agape. And it means love feast, love feast. And our love feast is communion where we feast on the Lord Jesus. And many Christians have begun to leave this feast by, um, by only having communion, say, once a month or once every three months or once every six months or once every 12 months or whenever. Um, however, when we study scripture, we find the early disciples who are our examples were shown to take communion on the first day of the Jewish week, which is our Sunday. Let's turn to Acts chapter 20, just so we all have it in our, read it in our Bibles. Acts chapter 20 and verse 7. And it says here, and upon the first day of the week, right, when the disciples came together to break bed, Paul preached unto them, ready to depart on the morning and continued his speech until midnight. All right, the first day of the week. All right, and the Amplified says here in verse 7, And on the first day of the week, when we were assembled together to break bread, the Lord's Supper, Paul discoursed with them, intending to leave the next morning, and he kept on with his message until midnight. It was a long preaching session. But they met together on Sunday and had communion, broke bread. And then if we just turn over to 1 Corinthians 11, Paul also says, you know, we're not limited to taking communion only once a week, but it's good to have it once a week at least because there's life and healing. When we take it by faith, there's life and healing. We, we, when we go to it, we remember <coughs> Jesus' body, the bread. He was broken, he was whipped, and in so doing, he bore every sickness, illness, disease, and the juice reminds us of the blood that Jesus shed to, so we could have forgiveness of sin. So communion reminds us healing and forgiveness. Healing's available and forgiveness of sins is available. And we need to continue to remember. And Jesus said, do it in remembrance. And Paul says, um, scripture shows we can have it often. So 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 26 says, for as often as you eat this bread, you drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death till he come. So I'm just trying to put it out there 
we know not to forsake the gathering together. We don't have in communion on our own at home. We are gathering with other believers. And even that's a sign of the end time where people stop gathering. Like we read that before in Hebrews 10, 25. People not gathering, that's an indication we are in end times. Whereas God's always wanted his people to gather. Praise God. And I'll just say, if we turn back to Mark chapter 4. In Matthew 13, Mark 4 and Luke 8, we have the parable of the sower and the seed. And it's given three times by three different men. Matthew, Mark and Luke. And three is a perfect witness. And this parable must be a key to understanding all parables because of what Jesus said in Mark 4, 13. Let's read it. And he said unto them, Know you not this parable? How then will you know all parables? So when we understand the parable, the sow and the seed, it opens us up to understand all the parables in the Bible. And a parable is a symbolic use of natural things to hide spiritual things from those who don't have spiritual eyes or ears to hear. And those that don't have spiritual ears to hear, I'll say that again, those who do have spiritual ears to hear will understand the spiritual truth being revealed. Right? Jesus always said, he that has ears to hear. So if we've got not our natural ears, if we've got spiritual ears to hear the word of God, God will give us understanding of his word. It'll just come alive. Hallelujah. He'll give us revelation, understanding. And Jesus speaks this parable and then he gives its meaning. And Jesus talks about wayside, which is hard ground, different grounds, stony ground, thorny ground and good ground. And let's just turn back to Matthew 13. Matthew 13, and let's read it, verses 3 to 9, it says, And he spake many things unto them in parables, saying, Behold, a sower went out to sow, and when he had sowed, some seeds fell by the wayside, and the fowls came and devoured them up. And some fell upon stony places where they had not much earth, and forthwith they sprung up because they had no deepness of earth. And when the sun was up, they were scorched, and because they had no root, they withered away. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprung up and choked them. But other fell into good ground and brought forth fruit, some a hundred, some sixty, and some thirty. Who has ears, let him hear. The seed being sown symbolizes the word of God, and the ground symbolizes the heart of man. And then Jesus gives them understanding. Let's just read it quickly. Verse 19 to 23, it says here. Well, verse 18. Hear ye therefore the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and understands it not, then comes the wicked one and catches away that which was sown in his heart. This is he which receives seed by the wayside. But he that received the seed into stony places, the same is he that hears the word and anon with joy receives it. Yet has, yet has he no root in himself, but dureth for a while, but when tribulation or persecution arises because of the word, by and by he is offended. He also that receives seed among the thorns is he that hears the word and the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word and it becomes unfruitful. Verse 23, but he that receives seed into the good ground is he that hears the word and understands it, which also bears fruit and brings forth some a hundredfold some 60 and some 30. Praise God. So to hear the word of the kingdom and for growth to begin, we must be in church where we can hear the word. And all heard the word. So all those people heard the word. But they didn't all produce fruit. And if no fruit is produced, we learned earlier in John 15, the branch is going to be cut off. And in Matthew chapter 7, verses 16 to 19, it says here, Jesus said, 
Oh, let's go from 15 with this topic. Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. You shall know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? Even so, every good tree brings forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree brings forth evil fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit. Neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Every tree that brings not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. Jesus said that. And then in verse 21 to 23, it says, Jesus said, Not everyone that says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that does the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works. And then I will profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you that work iniquity. That verse 22, if they're prophesying, let's believe they're spirit filled. Casting out devils, they know their authority. Doing wonderful works, operating in faith, right? But verse 23, when he says, I never knew you. They had no relationship. That knowing is an intimacy with the Lord. He wants relationship with us, not religion, um, not tradition. He wants relationship. It's a loving relationship. And these people, even though they were obviously, they'd, at some stage they were saved, spirit-filled, know their authority, doing many wonderful signs and wonders. But Jesus says, I know you're not. How serious is that? So people can be functioning in the body of Christ and still miss out. Because if Jesus doesn't know you, he's certainly not going to marry you. And why did Jesus say all this? Because we read in verse 24 to 27, it says, Therefore, whosoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him unto a wise man which built his house upon a rock. And the rain descended and the floods came and the winds blew and the beat upon the house and it fell not for it was founded upon a rock. And everyone that hears these sayings of mine and does them not shall be likened unto a foolish man which built his house upon the sand. And the rain descended and the floods came and the winds blew and beat upon the house and it fell and great was the fall of it. Both houses, both men heard the word of God. Only one was on the rock and one was on the sand. But they both heard the man on the rock, he heard and he did it. And the man on the sand, he heard and he didn't do. He didn't build his life. The rock speaks of Jesus Christ, the word, and the foolish man built his house on the sand. So are we wise or are we foolish? So question, if salvation is permanent, you know, you give your life to the Lord, if that's permanent, why have we been reading so many warnings so many times throughout scripture? And even in the book of Revelation, we're exhorted to repent. And the teaching that salvation is permanent implies we can do whatever we want and still think we can go to heaven. Is that right? May I say, let no man deceive you. Sin is sin. And we read it earlier. The wages of sin is death. So let's turn over to Romans chapter 6. Verses 1 to 2, and it says here, What shall we say then? Shall we continue to continue in sin that grace may abound? That's the question. And what's the answer? Verse 2, God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? All right, and then down in verses 14 to 16, it says, For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law but under grace. What then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law but under grace? Again, God forbid. Know you not that to whom you yield yourselves, servants to obey, his servants you are to whom you obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. Praise God. And then verse 18, being then made free from sin, you became the servants of righteousness. Yes, we just want to um, walk the walk in God's ways, uh, doing what's pleasing in God's sight. And, you know, we're only free from sin 
if we're truly servants of righteousness. And verses 19 to 23. I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmity, that's the weakness of your flesh. For as you have yielded your members, servants to uncleanness, and to iniquity unto iniquity, even so now yield your members servants to righteousness unto holiness. For when you were the servants of sin, you were free from righteousness. What fruit have you then in those things whereof you are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. But now being made free from sin and become servants to God, you have your fruit in holiness and the everlasting life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Praise God. Praise God. Now, I just would like to look at an example here. Let's turn to Acts chapter 5. I'm going to read about a married couple here. Acts chapter 5, starting in verse 1, going through to 11. But a certain man named Ananias with Sapphira, his wife, sold a possession and kept back part of the price, his wife also being privy to it, and brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled thine heart to lie to the Holy Ghost and to keep back part of the price of the land? Whilst it remained, was it not thine? And after it was sold, was it not thine own power? Why hast thou conceived this thing in thine heart? And thou hast not lied unto men, but unto God. And Ananias, hearing these words, fell down and gave up the ghost. He died. And great fear came on all them that heard these things. Verse 6. And the young men arose, wound him up, and carried him out and buried him. And it was about the space of three hours after, when his wife, not knowing what was done, came in. And Peter answered unto her, Tell me whether or not you sold the land for so much. And she said, Yea, for so much. Then Peter said unto her, How is it that you have agreed together to tempt the Spirit of the Lord? Behold, the feet of them which have buried thy husband are at the door and shall carry thee out. Then she fell down straight away at his feet and yielded up the ghost. And the young men came in and found her dead and carrying her forth, buried her by her husband. And great fear came upon all the church and upon as many as they heard these things. I always like to do a, an example, like say they sold the land for 100000 but they donated um, 80000 to the church. The lie was they implied, and I'm just making the financial figures up, they implied that 80000 was the total amount. That's where the deception was. They were just not quite on, true on it. If they'd said, look, Peter, we sold it for 100000 but we want to donate 80000 to the church, Fine, tick. But they held back and implied they were giving everything. And that's where the lie was. So things have to be in God. They're black or white. There's none of this grey. No white lies. It's got to be absolutely true. And Ananias and Sapphira, who were Christians in the New Testament church, we read it in the book of Acts, they were saved and under grace. And they dropped dead. And eternal judgment is one of Christ's doctrines, which is yet to be returned to the end time church. And let's turn over to Hebrews chapter 6. And we just read it here in verses... One to three. Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on to perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith towards God, of the doctrine of baptisms, plural, that's in water and the Holy Spirit, and of laying on of hands and of the resurrection of the dead and of eternal judgment. Eternal judgment has not yet been returned to the end time church. However, it must be returned so that we can go on to perfection which was written in verse 1, and perfection is full spiritual maturity. And let's turn over to 1 Peter chapter 4. It's coming. 
How do we know this? Because 1 Peter chapter 4, 17 to 18 says, For the time is come, the judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it first begin at us, what shall be the end of them that obey not the gospel of God? And if the righteous scarcely be saved, where shall the ungodly and sinner appear? Ananias and Sapphira, they lied over an offering and they died. Let's turn over to Revelation chapter 21. And in Revelation 21, we're told that no liars will be part of God's city, his bride. Let's read it again. And there shall in no wise enter into it, the city, anything that defiles, neither whatsoever works abomination or makes a lie, but they which are written in the Lamb's book of life. And in fact, we're also told in verse 8, let's just go back to verse 8. But the fearful and the unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers, idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. All liars. So that is all liars. And that, of course, includes Christian liars. And uh, nearly there, Ex Ezekiel, let's just turn back there, Ezekiel chapter 18. God's word is really clear. Ezekiel chapter 18 and verse 24. It says in verse 24, but when the righteous turns away from his righteousness and commits iniquity and does according to all the abominations that the wicked man does, shall he live? All his unrighteousness that he has done shall not be mentioned. In his trespass that he has trespassed and in his sin that he has sinned, in them shall he die. And verse 26 when a righteous man turns away from his righteousness and commits iniquity and dies in them for his iniquity, then, he, then that he has done shall he die. So imagine a Christian all their life, going good in God, growing, walking in the Lord, and then just down towards the end of their life, they turn away from God for whatever reason, turn away, and unfortunately, they die, say, that night, didn't repent. Their righteousness becomes unrighteousness and all their righteousness doesn't even count because it's how you finish your walk with the Lord. It's good to start well, but he wants us to stay in it all to the end. And if a righteous man turns away, he's going to miss out. And finally, let's turn to 1 Corinthians 10. And I'll say too, the, the opposite is for a person who's been unsaved all their life, you know, and they're finally just going to be on their last breath. I'm turning to 1 Corinthians 10 here. And, you know, they've, you know, their life has not been <laughs> terribly good before God, but just towards the end of their life, they, they really have a, a, um, a genuine repentance before God and, and they really call out to God and they say I'm really sorry and I, they understand that Jesus took their sin and they really are remorseful absolutely penitent and call out to God and ask him to forgive them God will forgive them and if that's their last up to date they'll just go straight to heaven and they were not good all their life but this topic was about can Christians go to hell well we've learned a lot of scripture tonight and finally, we read in 1 Corinthians 10, verse 12. It says here, Wherefore, let him that thinks he stands take heed, lest he fall. And the Amplified says, Therefore, let anyone who thinks he stands, who feels sure that he has a steadfast mind and is standing firm, take heed, lest he fall into sin. And we said all sin is unrighteousness. So in summary, can Christians go to hell? Yes. 
So may we continue to press into God and believe and receive his word and with God's help, make it to heaven. And everyone said, Amen.